All right, hello and welcome to Accidental Origin episode eight. My name is Brendan, uh, and this is your weekly writing web show, uh, where we talk about writing, art, creative process, and generally other fancy, fancy things. The fanciest, of course. For the, I don't know how many weeks in a row, uh, Ottawa is ridiculously hot only today. It was like 20 degrees the rest of the week. But today, today it's 30, more than 30. Um, and it's hot. It's very hot. I'm going to try and not say that it's hot as much as I can. As much as I can. Uh, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So yeah. Hope everyone's been having a good week. Things are good. My arms, my arms are funny colors. Why? I'm not sure how I feel about this right lighting setup yet, but we'll discuss more of that in moments. All right. So yeah, we're back. We're continuing on with um, the short story, Fear the Siren. This week, we're going to do a uh, Basically the rest of the planning stages for the plot. Uh, I've decided that next week we're going to do characters. So that should be fun. I've been doing a little bit of research today on uh, Greek, well, mythological creature, creatures in Greek mythology. So I have, I have an idea have an idea of who I want our mercenary to be. Have an idea. Have an idea. Um, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. But uh, this is the introduction. So uh, I'm gonna update you with what's been going on with me this week. Uh, specifically in terms of writing <laughs> and not just stuff in general. So yeah. So yeah. Hope the audio is all good. I played around with it a bit, but I couldn't. It's not quite where I want it to be yet. So I'm going to keep working on that and hopefully I can get it somewhere nicer for next week. But yeah, it's not quite, not quite. Ugh. I don't know why I'm so quiet today. Very quiet today. So, uh, first things first, we are on to round two of Game Chef. It is now the review phase. So I've been given my games to review uh, and people have been given my game to review. So there's gonna be feedback sometime in the next couple of weeks, which is awesome. Which is awesome. Uh, 
Um, I'm super excited. I'm super excited to get feedback. I know I'm my, my game is playable. It's not fun, <laughs> but it is playable. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the whole point, right? Well, you want your game to be fun. But the idea of a short competition is to challenge yourself in order to write uh, and design and, and do all those things and give you a framework. So I think with the feedback, there's definitely something there that is worth working on. So I'm going to continue to do that once I get the feedback. Um, and, and all that stuff has been, like, all the stuff has been posted to the website, which you can see down here. Look at that. I got the point right first. First try. I'm getting better at this. Website is down there. Um, so you can, you can read that at your leisure. And if you do have any feedback, feel free to send it on. Contact info is also on the website. So yeah. I'm, I'm not a good person to play a drinking game on because I am very habitual in the way that I speak <laughs> and things that I do. So yeah. Be smart. Don't play any drinking games. So tick mark number one, Game Chef update. Number two. <laughs> number two, uh, I spent a bunch of time today uh, trying to get my lighting correct because lighting a whiteboard, I mean mine's blue, but it's a dry erase board and, and all that is very difficult. <laughs> well, I mean lighting any reflective surface is extremely difficult. I made some headway. I got it to a much better point, but I still need, um, it's still a bit too much. My frame is a little too small. So I can't even fit myself into the frame. You'll see the test frame behind me there where, where I was looking at. It's close. I need to get some small soft boxes for my little, my little fill lights. so that I can do that properly. But progress is being made. Um, I was really hoping I would have it ready for this episode because this episode would be a great one to draw on the walls. But that, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't where I wanted it to be. It's close, it's close. We've made some headway. Always a good thing. Learning process, working on making things better. Tick mark number two. So, this comes to the last topic of the introduction. Something that I've been thinking about for the last little while. So, up to this point, I have been posting, well, with the exception of the game design ones, because I didn't have time to make them for those. Uh, but up to, up to this point, pretty much every episode has had show notes. Uh, basically my outline with filled in details of the material I'm covering for the week. I'm finding that they're taking up too much of my, my free time. So I'm doing those when I should be writing or doing something else. And I'm actually a couple episodes behind right now because I was doing writing and some of that other stuff. So I wanted to get feedback from all of you about what I should do with the show notes. I do still want to have something. I think that's important. I think it's a nice component to the educational aspect of the show, I guess. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a talk about that as well. But yeah, I, I was thinking that maybe I would just post the outlines that I write and not edit them, or maybe the show notes are completely unnecessary. 
I, I, I like them, but if they're not necessary, then I'm not going to invest time in them so that no one will read them, right? Like, that's... There are, there are better things I can be doing. I can be writing more, and I can be doing creative things. I can be working on other stuff that will make the show better. So, yeah. Um, please, let me know. <laughs> Send me a tweet. Send me an email, whatever. Let me know what you think. Um... I'm interested to know. I'm interested to know if people are reading the show notes at all. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I like that kind of stuff. I do. I think it's valuable. It's just, you know, I only have so much time. And I need to, I need to pick things that will make the show better and not just things that I like, you know. So, yeah. Um, thought process, thought process, yeah, I mean, that's fair, Johnny, if you watch the show, then you, you get the gist, it was more of a kind of I included. I wanted to include them as a reference so that if you watch the VOD, or if, so if you watch the show or you watch the VOD, and then we're talking to somebody later or we're writing a project later, uh, later on, you could go back and reference them real quick. But, I mean, perhaps that's not the right approach. Perhaps there's a an easier way to do something similar. Um, I'm not gonna cut the episode descriptions with the like links and that kind of stuff. I, I, I love those. And I think those are extremely valuable. And whether or not people read the show notes, I feel like those links people will actually take a look at. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not planning on cutting that stuff. But yeah, but yeah. All the so yes and but yes and passionate keyboards. Here we go. <laughs> Whew. I had a thought, I just lost it. Damn. <laughs> oh well. Okay. What was my thoughts? Something important. I forget. Ah. Oh, I remember now. I remember now. Right. So I had this thought earlier today. And I originally conceived Accidental Origin as an educational show. As a show to teach people about writing. Specifically, kind of in a similar format to what you'd get in, um, in like a post-secondary institution of sorts. Obviously, I'm not a professor <laughs> or anything like that, so I can't claim that I would have the same quality level as them. But that being said, um, have that kind of thing with, with a proper outline, with, with points, with things like that. But I realized uh, over the last week when I was thinking about it that I'm pushing really hard on the you need to learn things and you need to learn them in a certain order. And that's fine, but it's not super fun. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the most interesting thing to watch. And honestly, it's not, it's not even the most interesting thing to present all the time. Um, 
So I'm playing around a little bit more with the format, with what I want to do with the format. And I'd like to hear, I'd like to see some feedback. Um, I asked for a lot of feedback. I don't get a lot of feedback. I asked for a lot of feedback. But I'd like to see some more, I'd like to know what you think about opening up the show a little bit more, about making it a little bit more freeform by, you know, adapting to more situational stuff, problems that people are having in chat, problems that people send me, um, things like that. Uh, so I'm thinking a lot about that and the first step of getting to that spot was making the less detailed outlines, not planning every single point. Uh, and I think that helps a little bit, but I'm not quite there yet where, you know, I literally started this off, started off this episode saying, yeah, we're going to be doing scene work today and we're going to be doing characters next week. Which isn't good, because I think at the point in the writing process we're at, those are the right spots to be in. But at the same time, like, does that mean next week I'm going to, like, say, what is a character? What makes a good character? What makes a bad character? And do things like that again? Or would it be better for me just to show my thought process and answer questions? Um give insight into things beyond just the theory. And, and this is a conversation I had with my friend Robin a while back, which I totally get. Um, theory is everywhere. It's easy to find writing theory. I like to think, and I, I could be wrong, I like to think that I present it in an engaging way. Uh, but, I mean, theory, at the end of the day, is theory. So, I mean, maybe there's... Is there more benefit to showing just the practical stuff? Is there less benefit to that? I mean, I don't... This first story I really wanted to be kind of getting back to basics of a sorts, showing the beginners the way, uh, introducing writing to people who don't necessarily know anything about writing. Um, but maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe I need to approach it from a, uh, I know writing, here's how you should think about writing. And talk about like, talk about the basics when someone asks a question, when someone wants that information. So, I mean, these, these is, this is not something that's a concrete decision. It's something that I'm open to trying. Um, I, I, want, I want the show to be engaging. I want people to be interested in watching. You know, to be hyped up for the next episode. Uh, I want the stories I write on the on the show to be engaging, um, and I think they will be. But it's a process, right? It's a learning process. I mean, I'm also the type of person who asks a lot of questions. I'm very good at asking questions. And the reason I do that is because it helps me think through my problems. It happened a lot on uh, the game design episodes where I would just ask questions and the answer would come to me. So In a way, I, I'm right now. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to 
think through the process. I'm trying to ask the qu right questions to get to where we want to be. Um, and, and I'll continue to do so until I'm, until I'm, well, until everyone's, until everyone's having tons and tons of fun. <laughs> um, So yeah, th these are the things that I'm thinking about during the week. And if anyone has any insight, feel free to let me know. Um, I would love I would love to hear what you think about that. Because um, hey, I mean, the the reason I wanted to start streaming, and the reason that I got back into Twitch Creative, is because I wanted to have conversations with creative people about creative things. I wanted to push my friends and I wanted my friends to push me so that we could all become better. And I think in some ways I'm doing that. Uh, there's been a few times where people in the chat have been like, oh, hey, that's a really cool way of thinking about that. And I'm like, yeah, do it. Move forward, do the things that you, that you love to do. Um, and I know Johnny hanging out there has been like, yeah, you challenged me so much. And I'm like, yes, job accomplished. And I'm not afraid of having the audience challenge me. I mean, I'm not going to be right 100% of the time, <laughs> probably not even 50% of the time, but that's okay. That's what learning is about, right? Um, Learning from your mistakes, learning from your failures. It's important. So, yeah. Please, let me know. <laughs> um, let me know more of what you'd like to see. Uh, do you want to see more game design stuff? Because I can do that. I can, I can hook you up. It's not a problem. I can do other stuff. Uh, I can do film stuff. I can do comic stuff. And I'm planning on doing those things. Because uh, I think this is a great... This is a great venue uh, with a lot of different creative types. Especially visual types. Visual artists and all that. Where I think doing things like comics, like writing, writing in visual styles, would come across very good. Um, would translate really, really well. I have this idea for this really cool special event I'd like to do sometime in the future uh, about having a, a script that we're working, a comic script that we're working on and having um, various viewers submit pages and putting it together as, as kind of a stream PDF collaboration of all of us. So yeah, um, I'm open. I'm gonna finish this short story either way. Um, in a couple of weeks, uh, and I think this is a good time to talk about this, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be my birthday. Uh, so for the, bir for the day before my birthday, which is a Sunday, um, two weeks from now, we're gonna have a special uh, role-playing storytelling episode where I'm gonna invite a bunch of people on and we're gonna we're gonna do some storytelling stuff live, uh, which I'm super excited for. So that should be fun. Uh, but I'm also on vacation that week, so I'm gonna try my best to get all of the rest of the prep work done on this short story, so that that week. I can stream uh, a few more times during the week and we can do a, uh, like I can do a lot of the drafting that week, have a solid first draft done sort of thing. So that, yeah, like that's, that's my plan. I'd like to get all the prep work done uh, between this episode and the next episode so that after the fun episode, 
we can do draft it and get it done. And uh, yeah, that'll be a lot more of me thinking through problems and, and me working with the text and stuff like that. So um, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but yeah. With that in mind, now that we're half an hour in, and I've gone all existential and weird, let's, let's talk about what we're actually here to talk about. <laughs> talk about what we're actually here to talk about. So, today, uh, because I'm still experimenting with format and haven't changed it yet, we're going to talk about scenes. Um, scenes are the most basic unit of story. They are what make up pretty much every narrative. And... They are the next step from what we did last week with building our structure. Don't worry, Sam. There will be octopods. That, that is happening. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I, like, I'm, I'm completely serious. Uh, I was doing a bunch of research before I started the stream on Greek mythological creatures, right? And there are a lot of weird Greek mythological creatures, let me tell you. Um, some notables being like spiders with snake arms and stuff like that. Because that's, that's not creepy in the slightest. Not in the slightest. <laughs> True story. Zeus was way into bestiality. That was a thing. That was a thing. There was... I was actually reading about it today. Where, um... Plato... Was it Plato? I think it was Plato. I don't know if I have it open right now. Uh, I believe it was Plato was trying to get uh, the Homer poems banned. Or at least uh, not referenced as much because of the God's dubious moral character <laughs> throughout the entirety of the Odyssey. Well, not the well to the Odyssey to a certain extent, but mostly the uh, the Iliad. So, you know, uh, their morality was really messed up. <laughs> that being said, the Greek approach to religion uh, was extremely different uh, than the way that we've kind of approached uh, Christianity, uh, which is. Beliefs aside, has been the the dominant religion of the last fifteen hundred years or so, worldwide. Um, so there's a lot of influence narratively taken from from Christianity, um, and the and the way that our our societies are constructed uh, in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, so. A lot of the ways that the Gr Greeks approach religion was that humans were humans, gods were gods, gods were all powerful, but gods could do whatever they wanted. And if the humans angered the gods, they would be punished. Divine retribution.
So you couldn't be boastful, couldn't be prideful, couldn't be arrogant. That gets you turned into stuff, which is not fun for anybody. Uh, Arachne, Queen of the Spiders. Half spider, half female, because she lost a weaving competition. Well, I mean, the stuff about predetermined ends really is a lot more Norse mythology than Greek mythology. But you are correct. There was a lot of oracles and divining and that kind of stuff in Greek mythology. Um, in fact, I mean, visiting the Oracle was, was something people did, uh, all the time to gain guidance. And, uh, a lot of the stories are born at, a lot of the myths that we know are born out of tasks that Oracles have given heroes. Um, there's a lot of that. We should, we should totally do this, Sam. I debate, I debate very heavily that the Titans were gods. But that gets into a whole lack of weirdness that debate does. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. I know what you're talking about, but it's not coming to me. not coming to me. I don't know enough about Athena um, other than her origin story and the thing about nope I'm thinking of Artemis. I'm not even thinking of Athena. Yeah I got nothing. <laughs> For the record, I'm super into Atlantis. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super into Atlantis. <laughs> uh, especially Da Vinci's interpretation of Atlantis, but also the stuff that appears in Homer. But that's a conversation for another time. Another time. Just checking my notes here real quick. All, all four of them. Okay. So we're here to talk about scenes. We're here to talk about scenes and writing. So, what is a scene? A scene is basic is the most basic building block of a narrative structure. My lighting is really messed up right now. I see all blocky. I'm all blocky. Ugh. 
I have a couple of conflicting thoughts, and one of them is to remain distracted and keep talking about mythology. Um, and the other is to just push forward and attempt to, to talk about scenes, which I have so far failed to do. But yeah, uh, I think it's important to talk about mythology because like Christianity and the Bible and all that, uh, mythology has, uh, especially, especially Greek and Roman mythology, but they're not the only ones. Um, I mean, keeping in mind, this is all coming from a Western European perspective. Uh, and yes, North America is Western European perspective. Um, so... These are the basis for, for which most of our stories are told and have a lot of connections. Uh, oh, this, okay. This is the perfect time. I've been wanting to talk about this for like months and, and there was never an opportune moment. So here, 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 here we go. Here we go. There's a concept uh, that I studied in university called intertextuality. And intertextuality is how books, because uh, I studied this in English, so it was books specifically, but this is also true of art, it's also true of film, comics, uh, video games. It's true of all of them. But intertextuality is, this, is the specific study of how books influence each other. It's identifying the dialogue and the references that are that are something from something else that came before. And also things like parody, satire, um, genre conventions, how many fantasy films do we see nowadays that are based on things that were codified in Lord of the Rings? How many sci-fi films have we seen that were codified by things like Flash Gordon? How many things reference Shakespeare? The Bible. Greek myth. These are all forms of intertextuality. Intertextuality is super fascinating to me. Uh, a lot of the guys, or sorry, guys, a lot of the people that I really respect as writers, uh, as, as storytellers, are people who know how to take all of that stuff that came before and write something interesting based on that. People like Guillermo del Toro, who can deconstruct genres. Um, people like Scott McCloud, who literally, his, his claim to fame is deconstructing an entire medium in understanding comics. Who used Zot, his superhero comic, to tell a story about people, about art, about life. And, and in effect, deconstructed a lot of what superhero comics were doing at the time in a way completely different from the way that Watchmen just deconstructed uh, superhero comics.
I mean, Drawny, my lovable ma, Drawny, uh, she mentioned Percy Jackson. Percy Jackson is quite literally a bunch of references to old stories, old parallels. Mythology is super interesting because when you look at mythology across the world, you begin to see reoccurring patterns. You see similar types of stories, similar symbols, similar, no, similar characters. All of these things just go and show us that we're one people. That humanity interprets the world in a very similar way. And I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell and the monomyth idea. I mean, it's not perfect. I think there are, there are definitely cultural differences, but there's as many similarities as there are differences. You can see a commonality. Um... And today, when we're surrounded by the internet, when we're, when we're connected to everybody all of the time, we have so many more influences than we ever did before. And, and it's, it's wonderful and fascinating and we're also seeing um, we're also seeing a lot more references that trends that jump between mediums. We're making video game references in films. We're making novels about video games about films. Comic books. The type of storytelling that you see in comic books, video games that deal in panels, movies that deal in panels. We are in the, the most tumultuous age of amalgamation and transformation that we've ever been in. And, it, and it's awesome. But at the same time, it's, it's super easy to fall in the trap of, oh, this is like something else. Or to base something too heavily on something that came before. So, my point, I guess, in all of this, is that intertextuality is important. It's important to study the things that came before you, the things that influenced what you, what has influenced you. It's important to study things that have shaped our culture. Because understanding where things came from can give you insight into the mindset of A, the writers who came before you, but B, your characters. You begin to understand your own psychology and your character psychology and how they deal with certain societies. And you can start to see uh, and this is something we're going to talk about a little bit more towards the end with, with the writing sci fantasy and science fiction for the book club. But you see how those influences have built stories. Right, Johnny? Like, it's, it's part of art. It's part of everything. And context is super important. Context is one of the big things that drive intertext intertextuality. And it's not something that's talked about enough. In my opinion. 
Because... I think, I think the thing that really fails context, or really fails because of context, are actually reviews. We're in a society where everything is rated. It's easy to go and look, a, look up online someone's opinion about something. But what a lot of those people don't do is they don't give context for their opinion. And that matters. I'm going to bring up H.P. Lovecraft. Brilliant writer. Extremely creative. Um, extremely creative. Uh, designed a world that has that has blown our minds for over a hundred years. Uh, that people can't can't stop referencing. Super racist. Super racist. But contextually, almost everyone at the time was racist. And I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm just saying it, it's easy for us to judge from our society, the way that our society has developed. But at the time, there are, things, there, there are other things that were happening. And you've got to take that into context. Knowing certain political histories so you can see where satire came from. Why did this author write a, a satire of this popular book at the time? Because of politics, because of society, societal changes, because of protests. There are things that matter to why stories are told and how stories are told. Context matters. And I make the argument, I make the argument that the process for technology and the process for writing and art are the same. They are not different. Science is extremely creative. People don't think about it in a creative manner necessarily, but it is a creative process. It's an exploration. And I think, I'm of the opinion uh, especially with, with a lot of the stuff that I've tried to adopt from, from art practices and things like that. But I'm of the opinion that artists should spend more time learning about technology and learning about how technology is created and, and forms and morphs um, and, and, and take things from inventors, from businessmen, from salesmen, Figure out why and how they're doing what they're doing and how you can better your art by adapting your process. And a, a, a part of that, um, excuse me, oh. So Sam's right. I mean, what happens is, is you, once artists get skilled, then they challenge each other and they produce more technically complex things. But then you get the next part, the next swing of the pendulum, the next cycle, which is a deconstruction of those things that came before. Where they break all that technical stuff and, and, and try and get at its essence. For painting, that was Pablo Picasso. For music, that was 8 minutes 50 seconds. I think that's what it's called. 8 minutes 50 seconds. It's a score that is literally the music of the audience. There was a score during the deconstructionist period of music that was written for typewriters. So you had to have like a hundred different types of typewriters and they all played like hit specific keys at specific times and made music. So 
So, yeah, deconstruction, it's an important part. Um, I will write it down for you, Johnny. It's not something that's easily Googleable. It's not something that you can easily Google, uh, unfortunately. And I don't know if that's because there's a, a better term for it that I don't know about, but this is how we talked about it when I was in school. Uh, in, in a few different classes, not like, if it was one class, I'd be like, oh yeah, the professor just made that up, but it was in several classes. Um, but yeah. It's a crazy thing. But this, like, naming things is how society kind of evolves. You can't know what something is until you give it a name. You can know that it exists, but you can't describe what it is without giving it a name. I'll give you an example of that. Describe to me what the color blue is. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for chat to catch up with the delay. Also, Johnny, I'm going to try once I get my lighting correct, I'm going to use the whiteboard a lot more. Because I do agree with you, I need to do some more stuff. So I'm starting to get... So I'm starting to get definitions of blue. And I'm going to read them out. So blue is my favorite color. The color blue is the brainwave pattern created by the impact of certain frequencies of light on the retina. A color that means cold, sad, depressing, also water and sky. So then, so here's the thing. And, and here's kind of the point of this exercise. What if what if there was no term for brainwave pattern or for retina or frequency of light or cold or sad or depressing or water or sky? Favorite or color? We have given language. Well, and, and, and here's the kicker, because I'm going to describe, I'm going to describe language and I can only use labels. Language is a oral, a set of oral symbols, stuff that we've interpreted over time to mean certain things that change as society changes. And I agree with you, Sam. They exist. They have always existed. But you can't have a conversation about them until both of the, con the conversers have a similar term to use in order to describe something. It's, it's one of the things that makes translations so hard. 
where there are inflections that we have no words in English for. Where there are concepts that we don't understand because we don't have a label for them. And so they get translated to the closest thing and some, some context is lost. And I agree with you that that's what math is for. That's what um, music is for. That's what art is for. Visual art. But at the same time, what we're doing here is we're writing. We're using this set of language in order to describe something, particularly a narrative. And well, I don't know. I've said a lot of things, um, but it's five to eight, and I need to take a break uh, and cool off a little bit. But yeah, think think about think about what I've said. <laughs> um, Yeah. When we get back, we're going to talk about scenes. Um, and instead of talking, well, actually, instead of talking about scenes, I think I'm just going to dive right into doing scenes for the short story. I think it'll be a better... Um, Yeah, I think I think it'll just be better <laughs> than than trying to whittle away at the definition of scenes uh, and what scenes mean. I think this the stuff I want to talk about will come out as I as I work on it. <laughs> and I definitely think that that's something I'm going to try and do more of as the episodes progress because. As fascinated as I am about the stuff we just talked about, what did you really get out of it? How is it going to influence your writing? I think I need to open up a word processor and, and write and, and talk about writing as I write and talk about why I'm thinking what I'm thinking. Yeah. I think that's what I'm going to do. But first, we're taking a break. So yeah, break time.
All right, I'm back. I am back. So we're going to talk about outlining, specifically outlining scenes. And we're going to take it from the point where we ended off last week, where we started with uh, well, we ended up with basically our plot structure. So, we're going to use the tried and true method. Something that has been done for many a year. We're going to use cue cards. Now, cue cards, <coughs> excuse me, I've heard a lot of different writers talk about cue cards um, as being an excellent writing tool, and I tend to agree with them, though I don't use them as often as I probably should. I do kind of think about the same things, though, and outline in a similar way though without the actual cue cards. Thankfully, um, modern technology has made it a lot easier for us to do things with cue cards. Rather than having physical ones, we can have digital ones. And one of the best parts about the software I use, uh, Scrivener, which I think is in here. Boom. Yes, there we go. Scrivener is that I can have actual cue cards that I can move around and reorder, which is one of the main benefits of using cue cards, where you can take all of the scenes that you have in mind and you can put them in the proper structure order and then reorder them whenever you want. If you think that there's a problem with the structure, if you think that there's maybe uh, something that can, something better, you can reorder them. Um, so in this case, our each cue card is going to be a scene. It's important to keep in mind that every scene has a beginning, a middle, and an end. There is a setup to the scene. There is a conflict there is a resolution. Every scene. They're much smaller, of course. Uh, you're not going to wrap up your entire character's like dramatic need in a single scene. But it's important to keep that in mind, that, that they're built upon the same foundations that your overall story is based on. So, Fear the Siren. Um, what kind of scenes are going to be in Fear the Siren? Well, good old Chuck is a rebel and breaks the rules all the time and does what he wants. So, what else? So, here's, here's the argument I'm going to make, Sam. Even if Fight Club only presented middles and ends, that doesn't mean that the beginning never existed. Just like we're going to start our story way after the inciting incident. But that doesn't mean that the middle never, that the beginning never happened. So I guess 
in, in a lot of ways, what I'm saying is, while every scene has a beginning, middle, and end, just like an, uh, just like a plot, you don't have to show the beginning, middle, and end necessarily. And they don't have to be in a linear order. So, what scenes are we going to have in, in Fear the Siren? pop back real quick to our um, to our outline ooh that's big <laughs> so what scenes are we going to have well ooh, whoops change this real quick where's the thing uh, inspector how do I turn this off no uh, crap <laughs> I forgot how to turn the inspector off Sam how do I turn the inspector off I rarely use the inspector, so it's <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> My bad. Go back to our cue cards here. So I'm gonna look at this list and I'm gonna name off things that I see as scenes. So we have a uh, meeting at the stable. I realize that it's going to be pretty small. Uh, at first, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Uh, but when we do the inspector, you'll actually see all of it. But just to give you a quick idea. Um, so there's a meeting at the, the King's Stable. There's a fight with the Siren. There's a confrontation at the ritual. Uh, oh, hitting things. There's a aftermath and or epilogue. There will be some sort of goblin stealing thing. And, uh, there's going to be a tense moment between Siren and Merc. I decided that I'm not going to call him Killer for Hire anymore. Cause that's super long. I'm just gonna call him a merc. Short for mercenary. Which is basically what a killer for hire is. Tricky, tricky, tricky protocol. In the epilogue, the conflict is not necessarily going to be a story driving conflict. Uh, it's more likely going to be a presentation 
of um, a previous conflict and how it was resolved. We're going to see the wrap up and resolution of, of all a lot of the previous conflicts. Uh, so yeah. So we have this handy thing here with our cue card. And I figured out a few things with my settings in order to actually blow this up so people could see. Because this was tiny before. Tiny. Yes, yes it is visible. Okay. So, who's in the meeting at the table? Um, this is what I like to do when I'm outlining scenes. Um, it's not the only way to do it, and sometimes you don't need all of this stuff. But um, I kind of want to show you a way to do it. So, which characters are in the scene? Where is the scene at? Um, if you were doing a story that had multiple perspectives, I don't think this is one. I think this is all entirely going to be the mercenary's perspective. Uh, but you could, you would say, state which uh, perspective this chap or this scene was going to be told from. Um, and also another important note is to, or another thing to note is whether or not the scene is not internal or an external scene. It's important to have a good balance of both internal and external scenes. External scenes being those that have action that drive the plot forward and internal scenes which have introspection and have the character confront themselves. Basically the idea is is that you want action moving the plot forward which is then in, intro like is then internalized by the character and they have to deal with the fallout emotional fallout of that action. You don't necessarily need to alternate them, but you should have a few internal scenes for every external scene. For you should have it you should have one internal scene for every few external scenes. Sorry, I nearly got that mixed up. Uh, mostly just to break things up. I don't know if you've seen... Uh, the best example I can think of right now is Transformers Extinction. But Transformers Extinction suffers from a problem of having too much action. They're, the moments that break up the action are not nearly enough. And... It suffers. It's you're constantly tense. By diversifying your scenes between external and internal, you break up the tension. Which is a good thing. You want um oh yeah. Excellent. Let's do let's do a drawing. Let's draw some. This is going to look weird as hell. <laughs> well, yeah, but that's Michael Bay's problem is is the exact thing the exact thing I'm thinking of. Yeah. So basically the idea is that you have, it starts off at its least tense moment, and at the climax of the story, you're going to be at your most tense moment. 
Focus. There we go. So least tense. Most tense. And you would think that you would just go linear. That you would just go point A to point B. My hand's kind of in the way. It's, well. Oh, this works. Maybe. It keeps focusing on my hand. It's weird. I don't like it. There we go. Should I rotate this? I can rotate this. Let's rotate this. Uh, that way. Oh, wrong thing. Whoops. <laughs> uh, fun experiments. But this is what makes things interesting, right? This is why we do it live. We do it live. It works, it's fine. It does the trick. So yeah, you would think that this would be the best way to do it, but it's not. The reason for that is that at the climax, if you had just gone linearly, this has no impact. Because everything that came before it was also tense. You need to contrast, just like you need to contrast values in order to give them impact. Uh, talking a little bit in visual art terms, you need to contrast your scenes. You need to contrast the tension of your scenes. So the best way is to go from least tense to most tense. Is to do it like this. Right? Where in most cases, the way, uh, in the most simplest sense, this would be an external scene and this would be an internal scene. External, internal. And I'll, I'll put a scan of this uh, on, in with the, uh, the links and all that for this episode so you can see it in a less weird perspective. But the reason for this is that the internal scenes don't tend to have conflict in the same way. Yeah, exactly, drawing internal monologue. The internal scenes are how they solve them. The external scenes give you a conflict, and the internal scenes are the resolution of that conflict. And how they and how it affected them and how it changed them and all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> the internal scenes tend to be a lot less tense because there isn't things necessarily happening to the character at that moment. That being said, it depends on the type of story you're writing. I'll go back to a, an easier to see thing. It depends on the type of story you're writing. I'll go up to this one. Because uh, a story with a 
heavy internal conflict is actually probably going to have more internal scenes than external scenes. And the internal scenes are probably going to have more conflict and more drama than the external scenes. So you would just inverse this. Where the external scenes are kind of your falling back moments. They break up all the internal mess that's going on. I'm not describing the show. I'm talking about stories. Hot mess. I get it. <laughs> but yeah. So I, I hope that makes sense. So, um, going back to Fear the Siren. Who, uh, what character is going to be in this scene? Uh, the billionaire. And killer for hire. Location. King's stable. Synopsis. What happens in this scene? Well, this is our inciting incident scene, which is not going to take place at the beginning. It's actually going to come a lot later. Probably somewhere towards the middle, I'm thinking. But, yeah, what happens in this scene? Uh, the billionaire pays the KFH to track down and assassinate assassinate the siren. Oh, that didn't do what I thought it would. Huh. Interesting. Okay. So that's one scene. Next scene, fight with the siren. Characters. Uh, location. Synopsis. Copy that. I'm just gonna paste this in so that it's ready for us when we get there. Siren. Um, it's pretty likely that the killer for hire is going to be in most of the scenes, uh, seeing as he's the main, he's the perspective character. Where is this going to take place? Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm totally missing a scene. Y you know what character that we haven't talked about at all, or not nearly enough? The sleeping fawn. Where did he go? He needs a scene. They need a scene where they discover him of some sort. Okay. So where does this take place? Winter waterfall, somewhere near the ocean, because she's a siren. Deep dark monsters den. Seduced into a ceasefire by the siren's call. Mm. I kind of. Mm. Where did I do with you? Oh, 
thought I had. I guess I didn't. I didn't have it on this. Note to self. Uh, note to self. Find the list of uh, <laughs> of prompts. I'm gonna need that in here for later, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know why that's not in here. That's that's annoying. Spells will just have to work without it. Um, I think this will be. Yeah, I know I have the mind maps, but I don't really want to go find them. <laughs> uh, maybe I can do it real quick. Oh, I can. Cool. Oh, don't show that on the screen. There we go. Uh, perfect. Let's zoom out. So there's a winter waterfall, a decaying house, and the king stables. King house. Do we want this to be this conversation to be at the the decaying house? Hey, I'm so organized. I found that within thirty seconds. Whatever. Welcome, welcome to the mind of a writer. I forgot about the mechanical arm. No, I, I want the mechanical arm to be part of her backstory. Perhaps the result of another dumb demon summoning ritual? I'm, I'm keeping track of all my random questions. Find it very useful for detailing out characters <laughs> and all that stuff, which we'll be doing next week. Detailing out characters. So be there. We're going to talk about mythology a lot. Okay. Siren. Killer. I agree entirely, Sam. The mind of a writer is, is a house with fire in the basement. Well, you're right, Johnny. The mind of a writer is a da dangerous place. Dangerous place. Why do you think they're all alcoholics? Drug addicts. Who else is here? Sleeping Fawn, Billionaire, Goblins. Those poor gobbles. This takes place at the Winter Waterfall. Under the Moonlight. Funnily enough, I'm the exception to the rule. 
but I do have a very highly addictive personality type, so <laughs> kind of avoid things. Uh, also because um, I'm a bit of a personal believer in not not numbing any emotional pain <laughs> as, as part of experiencing things but that's probably just bad decisions <laughs> all around um, winter waterfall under the moon nice synopsis Kill for hire, burst in to disrupt the ceremony. Disrupt. There we go. I can spell. I can spell. Uh, the ceremony. A conflict ensues. The siren gets captured. And a feather stolen. Dun, dun, dun. Good enough. I'll come back to that. I don't have uh, an idea of where I want this to be yet. So I'm not going to fill that in. Uh, goblins. Yeah. Goblins try to steal a feather, but are chased away. Okay. Hey Frank, what's going on? is going to be a decaying house. A lot of things happen at this decaying house. Um, the siren and the KFH talk about their pasts. Yes, the fawn is part of the ritual. The fawn is a sacrifice. Did I not do that? Yes. Which, actually, I'm going to put a new scene in here. Gobbles capture the fawn. So I'm, I'm detailing out scenes. Um, in the final story, I don't think that every single one of these is necessarily going to make the cut. Uh, specifically that last one I just added. I don't think that the gobbos capturing the fawn is going to be a, something that happens on screen, as it were. But it's still important to note that it is a potential scene and will have plot impact. So it happens regardless, it just happens off screen.
Vaughn is sleeping and is captured by the Gobos. Gotta love them Gobos. Yeah, that poor fawn. Huh. Is this the same scene that I'm thinking of? No, I wanted a scene where the killer for hire meets the fawn before the fact. Uh, I love those gobos. I know that they're basically... They've basically been relegated to... Um, the the joke sidekick characters like they're the hyenas and the lion king sort of people but i still love them and, and i don't want anything bad to happen to them we'll see we'll see how they turn out um winter waterfall the killer for hire Tracks the siren and meets the fawn. Uh, okay. So what are we missing? We have the beginning. First scene. I did that thing again. First scene is going to be... Pop out. Stop it. No. Stop doing the thing. Okay, there we go. The fight. Uh, then, we're going to have the tense moment, I think. I think the te tense moment happens next. I really wish that Scrivener gave me an option to mess around with these settings so I could actually make these big. Because it's kind of annoying. And it's probably confusing. So these two here are at the end of the story. This happens here. There's a meeting at the stable. The fawn gets captured. We're gonna do it like this, I think. I think this is the way I wanna do it. So what we're doing right now is this is a um, This, this story is going to be non-linear. As a short story, uh, if you listen to Vonnegut's Rules About Writing, um, that you want to start as close to the end as possible. So we're going to start with the fight. And... This is something I wanted to do last week, but couldn't. Uh, so I'm gonna try again this week. Now that I have this fancy secondary cam and drawing paper. Um, oh, that's my stomach. That That's just more of my stomach. Come on, what are you doing? Oh, I did it again. <laughs> Hot mess. Hot mess, I tell you. Counterclockwise. Okay, there we go. We're doing this live. Ah. Oh. Awesome. Okay. 
So, um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to pop open the outline here on the screen. No, you guys can't see it. But our basic three act plot looks like this. Right? I feel like a super hype artist doing this. Like, oh yeah, look at my drawing skills. <laughs> Don't act like you're not excited over that, Johnny. Whatever. Inciting incident. This is going to be confusing. I can flip this. I can flip this. Let's flip this. Flip. Oh, no, nope, that's the wrong one. Hey, I got there. <laughs> oh, man. So many things. <laughs> so many things. So yeah, this is the outline for the short story that we're working on. Uh, falling action, rising action, resolution, if I could spell, uh, setup. Right? Bye, Frank. Thanks for coming. So this is the basic structure, right? Now I can kind of start filling details in, right? So here, in the inciting incident, this is where the billionaire hires the killer for hire. Here is the confrontation with the ritual, or at the ritual is probably better. I need another color. Draw blue squares around. Around scenes. Right? So there's two, two of our scenes. The fight with the siren occurs somewhere around here. Be consistent, be consistent, Brendan. So this is our fight with the siren. Uh, the goblins, I mean, this isn't a perfect timeline because uh, a couple of the scenes happen on a linear timeline, which would look more like this, and don't actually really do deal with this structure, but I'm just gonna put them in kind of the order that I think they occur in. I know it's a black trend pen, Ronnie. It was the closest one. I regret everything. We had a, we had a huge fight earlier about uh, what pens are the best. And uh, I said black pens were the worst because they're the least useful. <laughs> I stand by my opinion. They are not at all useful for writing because when you print stuff out, it's printed in black and white. So any color, any color, blue, whatever, is better. <laughs> no one asked you, Sam. No, no. 
Not true. I disagree. Uh, so other things we got. Okay, it wasn't a huge fight, but it was a fight. <laughs> um, so this is our tense moment. Yeah, but who cares if it's blue or black for writing the actual text? It doesn't matter. It's exactly the same. Uh, the gobos are here and here. Gobbo one. Gobbo two. It doesn't matter which one is which, they're about the same. They're basically in order. Uh, so one of them is in the one that they try and steal the fawn, the other one is the one where they try and attack the siren. Um, actually, no, I'm wrong. I am wrong. Because Gobble 1 should be uh, siren, and Gobble 2 should be fawn. Because we're going to put the, the KFH meets Fawn in between them. So right, here we go. Obviously... Uh, I'm gonna write this down on my notes here. The uh, the fawn and the siren have a history. Yeah, I, I draw my ones as lines. But oddly enough, I draw my sevens with like that weird F thing, like this. Anyway, you can't see that. I don't know. It makes no sense. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. So this would be our aftermath scene would be somewhere around here and probably does both the following action and the resolution. Whenever, whatever that is, because I don't know yet. I haven't figured it out. Did I mean anything? Nope, I think I got it all. So this is the way that the scenes kind of go in terms of the, the narrative arc. Right? The, the goblin scenes don't really contribute to the narrative arc, but that's okay. Um, I included them as, as point of reference, sort of thing of where they happen on the timeline. Um, but we're not gonna write, like in the final story, we're not gonna write them in this order. If we did it in this order, it'd be non-linear. Or sorry, it'd be a linear uh, narrative. For short stories, I don't think linear narratives are good. Uh, this kind of narrative works really well in a film, um, can do well in a novel, it depends on the novel, some, some do it better than others. But we want to start as close to the end as possible. We want to make our beginning as interesting as possible, and we don't have the space in order to develop it in the same way. So, that being said, red pen. This fight with the siren, that's gonna be scene number one. This tense moment, scene number two. Then, because of this tense moment, which is gonna be an, uh, an, more of an internal scene than an external scene, we're gonna see flashes of backstory, which will be these guys here. Well, actually, these three, I'll draw this a little thicker. These three and this one. 
So these are going to be backstory fills. They're going to show us things about the character and move the advance the action forward. Yeah, I got it right. So backstory is going to be number three. Billionaire hires is going to be number four. It's part of the backstory, but I want it to occur last out of the backstory. Um, this Gabo capturing the fawn thing, that's going to be number five. It's going to give us the motivation to head towards the climax. which will be number six, and the aftermath being number seven. Does this make sense? Do you understand my thought process here? Get that out of the way. That's okay. I'm cool with gibberish. I know that you personally can't write like this at all, Sam. So I understand why, <laughs> why it makes no sense. But this is kind of how you plan, right? Um, and I realize that you don't do that. You're the, you're the spew, spew and shape type where I'm the, I'm, I'm the mold type. So yeah. Anyway, it's uh, five to nine, so I'm gonna take another break. And um, yeah, when we get back, we'll discuss uh, the book club and a few more other random things that will probably distract me, uh, cause that's how it is. And yeah. So, quick break. I'll see you all in five. Ah, uh, I'm totally making Jello after this stream. That's gonna happen. Okay, break time.
All right, we're back. Look, look, I, I, I did a thing. I did a thing. Now it doesn't look like so ridiculous anymore, though it is kind of blurry. <laughs> Blown out. Oh well. Temporary solution. Temporary solution. Oh, I forgot about the fan. One sec. I, yeah, I've been turning that on during the breaks just to help move the air around, not make it so hot, <laughs> so ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, it totally is. <laughs> so yeah, um, if anyone has any other ideas for uh, scenes, now would be the time to speak up. Because uh, otherwise, we're going to move on. <laughs> well, you know. Not gonna happen. Yeah, that camera, anyway. <laughs> Okay, I think that's it. Uh, there might be one, uh, I kind of want to go back. I want a siren backstory sort of scene, but I'm not quite sure what that's gonna entail. Siren, other sirens, gobbles, goblins, how she lost her arm, uh, CK. Yeah, yeah. There you happy? So, last part of the show, part three, the ending. Uh, you guys are awesome. So, Part three, Accidental Book Club. Uh, for those just tuning in or those who don't know, the Accidental Book Club is me reading a bunch of books about writing that I've had for years and never read. Uh, because like any person who collects books, if I don't read it within a couple weeks, it just sits on the shelf forever and never gets touched again. Um, 
So yeah, uh, this week we are continuing with writing fantasy and science fiction uh, by Orson Scott Card and other writers at uh, Writer's Digest. Um, I didn't read a ton, but I did get quite a bit more of the way through Sid Field that I'm way behind on. <laughs> um, but I did read a little bit. Uh, so the part I was reading right now was on, uh, was actually part four, uh, of four. I skipped parts two and three because they're a overall history of speculative fiction and steampunk. Uh, those two are the least interesting to me, so I'm probably going to keep those for last. And, uh, last week I talked a lot about the first part. So we're gonna, we're gonna skim over that for now. Man, this Gorilla Pod is awesome. I'm I'm so glad I bought it. It like it's so stable. It does not move. Um, I originally was testing the frame with this mounted on the back of the chair facing outward. So cool. So yeah, uh, this week I was reading about uh, medieval societies, uh, feudalism, mannerism, uh, mannerism. Manneralism? There's a thing. There's a thing. I'm gonna pop it open here. Ah. Manorialism. Gotcha. There we go. Uh, and Christianity and social order and how medieval societies work. Uh, the vast majority of fantasies that we see nowadays are based upon medieval societies. Uh, and, and how medieval societies are constructed. That's not 100% true across the board. We tend to use a sort of weird post-medieval medieval that has a lot more innovations from things like the Renaissance and other historical eras, uh, levels of technology and such and so forth. Uh, things like, like uh, advanced crossbows, gunpowder, uh, trade. Uh, there's a lot of trade and economic innovations that didn't occur until much later, printing presses. Things that are sort of medieval, but really came later. Um, that's the tech level of the traditional fantasy fantasy world. Um, yeah, stirrups are a great example. Uh, medieval knights didn't really use stirrups. That wasn't really a thing. Um, yeah. Uh, there's lots of stuff. Uh, I mean, even blacksmithing techniques to a certain extent uh, are not portrayed uh, accurately in fantasy uh, in the same way. Um, coins, to a certain extent, uh, the way that uh, money systems work, completely different. Um, there's other stuff. And I'm sure there's a ton of lists on the internet about that, that kind of thing. But yeah, so I was reading a lot about uh, medieval society. Uh, which is cool. Studying history, like I was saying with intertextuality, studying history is a great way to see how societies were built and how societies change and narratives. Uh, why things happen. You want to start a war in your novel? How did World War I start? How did World War II start? How did the Great War, how did the War of 1812 start? There are commonalities. They're not all the same, for sure, but there are commonalities. Economics, politics, societal stuff, um, revolutions, protests, intertextuality, context. So yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what this, this entire chapter is kind of about. It's about the context of medieval societies. How, how 
what what ways were they run? How did people live? Giving you context for building your fantasy society. So yeah. Intertextuality. Context. Important concepts. I know they're I know they're very abstract, but they're still important. <laughs> Um, so yeah, other than that, um, next week will be characters. Uh, I'm going to write out next week. I'm going to write character profiles for all the characters and give them names. Important. We're going to talk about that for sure. The importance of names, um, which actually funnily enough, lives a lot in intertextuality and context. So, there you go. Um, but yeah, so that'll be next week. The week after will be the special role-playing stream. Uh, and I will, I will remind everyone of that next week as well. Uh, but that will be happening. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to do something a little different, change things up. And uh, yeah, that we will be doing some heavy drafting of the first draft. It's okay, Johnny. I'll explain it to you later. <laughs> Off stream. When, you, when you've had sleep. So yeah. Um, other than that... Uh, let me know what you think about the show notes. Let me know what you think about all that stuff I said in part one uh, about the format of the show. Uh, please give me feedback. Uh, I can't improve without, without your opinions. So uh, let me know. Uh, if you go to the website. Oh, yeah, I got it pretty much first try again. I'm getting better at this. Uh, if you go to the website, accidentalordin.com, you can see uh, my notes and links for each episode, uh, supplemental stuff. Um, there are uh, all the VODs and also uh, ways to contact me if you want to please do um, so yeah I'm opening up the floor to any questions or derailments as you may have it uh, other than that we're going to close out. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we're good. I didn't have a thought there. That was not a thought. <laughs> Sorry. I know it seemed like one, but it wasn't. Oh, other thing I'll mention is I am going to get... I'm going to get the whiteboard ironed out. I got to I gotta get some... I gotta make or get some soft boxes for my little lights and I will do it. I will fix it. I was so close today. I think my lights are just too big for the amount of space I have. So if I use the little lights, it should work. I think it will work. Um, Cause the problem was, is I had to frame, I have to frame out the lights, right? Like, so you, so you don't see the giant glow on either corner which gave me a much smaller space than I, than I really could use. Uh, so I think with the smaller lights, I should be able to do it properly. Hopefully, hopefully, Urgh. Um, so yeah. Give you one last special treat. <laughs> mm. I, I don't, uh, 
Talk to me off stream about that, Robin. We'll talk about alien introductions. It's fine. Because I fixed the thing that I was working on. It's much better now. You gave me good advice. Chat's so lewd right now. Tisk tisk. Tisk tisk. What kind of giveaway? Oh yeah, uh, Sam, do you want to do that? Do you want to get on Skype with me for an episode and just do that interview style thing? I'm cool with that if we want to do that, but you got to be in. I don't know when it'll happen, probably like a month from now. <laughs> but yeah. Ew, EA. No, because Rob's, I'm going to have you on uh, a later episode when we talk about editing. Because I want you there for that. I've been very proud of myself too, Droney. I did not once say it's too hot. I'm so proud of myself. Yeah, I know what your skills are. I know what your skills are. But yeah, I, I do want to do that. Uh, I'm planning on having that happen. I was waiting until I had more a more concrete like idea of when that would be. I'm thinking, if I look at my calendar, let's go back to big face. Whoa, big face. I go back to here, look at my calendar. Uh, I'm going to be doing heavy drafting the week of the 11th to the 17th, and I know you're away. So if we could do probably something around like the 31st, that'd be perfect. Well, we'll we'll work. Hey, I only did that once too. Good for me. Um, we'll work out those details later. No, are you not back yet, or are you just busy? Ooh, that sucks. That's super lame. Well. Let me know when you well, let me know the time frame of your trip and we will figure something out. It depends how much drafting I get done. Because <laughs> uh, I want to finish, I actually want to do it not the way I usually do it and do like all the weird iterations with the editing. I want to do it the proper way with actually writing up a full draft before I do edits. Um, Cause I'm a crazy man. The next one will do my way and people will be like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's fine. Okay. Oh. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll message you about that later. We'll get it sorted out. Cool. Cool. Um, it actually got cooler, funnily enough. Yeah, no one wants to do it my way, <laughs> except me. Um, my way's not fun for anybody, 
except me. Um, Sam hates my way. Like, absolutely detests it. But, you know, writers are different. Processes are different. Don't be afraid to experiment. So, yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to close out the stream then. Check out website. Oh, look at that point. Check out the website, accidentalorigin.com. Go to Twitter. Um, check me out on Twitter, at FreakLabMishaps. If you want to get in contact with me uh, or just follow along for stream updates, uh, I am going to try and be a little bit better about stuff like that. Uh, oh, and I guess we didn't really decide anything with the show notes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to post the meager outlines I had for episode seven and episode eight and just post those. I am going to finish writing show notes for five and six, which are the game design episodes because they didn't have show notes. So I'm going to write some, uh, I will finish those proper, which is okay. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll post the meager outlines and if people don't like that, if they would prefer to have the full ones, I'll go and finish those later. Uh, I'll go and fill them out. That's not a problem. But I will post those ones, at least, for now. Uh, that's the idea I came up with. So I can spend less time doing that and more time writing, which would be nice. <laughs> Get some projects done, submitted to places. I'm planning on submitting to a couple magazines within the next two months. I'm hoping by the end of July. Uh, I pushed it off a couple months because I've been slow and I've been doing streaming and like a bunch of stuff, but, uh, but yeah, I'm going to submit something within the next couple months. So the end of the summer at the latest, I want to finish it by the end of July though. I'm going to say the end of July. I prefer to have it done by the 11th so I could just draft fear the siren and not have to worry about any other, anything else, but we'll see how that goes. I have no idea if anyone reads the show notes. I don't know, really, like, I've looked at the traffic and there are some people who visit my website, but the numbers are low. So, I don't know. Um, doesn't matter, whatever, we'll figure it out. Constant improvement. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, it's a learning process. We're all learning. But yeah. So it's just about 9.30. I'm going to take off. You know how to contact me if you need to. Finger guns. Random awkwardness. Can I make it more awkward? Probably, but I'm not going to. Anyway, this is me. I'm out. Oh, that was a horrible outro. This is Brendan. God, this is, yeah. You know, let me... Here, let me let me let me start again. I'm gonna I'm gonna flip back. Oh, pretend I'm working. Pretend I'm working. And then, oh God, messing everything. <laughs> so my name is Brendan. This has been Accidental Origin. I'll see you guys next week. Bye. Uh, that was better. Thank <laughs> you.